Good afternoon, Matanistas. Back in Madrid again. It's springtime. The Plaza Mayor, the central square, is decked out in blue. Yes, that means it's another titanic clash in the Champions League at the business end of the competition between Real Madrid and Manchester City. First leg is here in Madrid, second leg a week later in the quarterfinals at the Etihad. We did pretty well last time. Can we do it again? Join me and find out in today's Match Day Vlog. And yes, it's great to be here in short sleeves in the sun. I've not been in the UK for a week, but I believe it's pretty grim over there at the moment with a storm raging. Anyway, interesting mix of supporters here because there are matches on consecutive nights here in Madrid. Pretty awkward to arrange, I think, but it's all been good natured. We have some fun and a sing along with Dortmund fans in an Irish pub late last night and a few Real Madrid fans joining in that I didn't see any Atleti supporters. And I know that the Plaza Mayor here is very popular with visiting football supporters. It does seem as if there's a policeman nearly for every visiting supporter. But I have to say that this, in terms of drinking and being boisterous and singing and chanting, is a very good place to go. But in terms of the quality and price of the food and drink that you get, it is absolutely not the best place. So I'm going to head off for the food segment in the very, very nearby Calle Cavabaca. And if you're an away fan visiting Madrid, I'd recommend you do the same. I'd better dash because most of the best places close at four. I did this trip a few years ago, in fact I come here every year, but I have highlighted how close this street is, but for those of you who didn't see it, I'll do another little time-lapse video and walk with you to the street where all the good tapas bars are. And before we do go on our little walk, I should also mention that both this place and the really nice covered gourmet market, the Mercado de San Miguel, which is the other side of the square, are crawling with pickpockets. I nearly got done two years ago. Football fans who are half drunk are very rich picking, so be very careful if you're in either of these two locations, especially if you have your back to what's going on and you're trying to get a drink at a bar. They operate in teams and they actually creep up on you without you noticing. And even a barman who's standing on the other side of the bar who should tell you what's going on, they never seem to do so. Also, a threat from the Islamic State against all four quarterfinals. I don't think that's going to pass because I don't think they'd warn about it. And most of their finance goes through the Gulf, particularly Qatar. So I would have thought that the UAE and Qatar, who have skin in this game, would have enough influence to call those dogs off. I'm not saying they're directly controlled by those countries, but a lot of their finances are rooted through them. Let's head off for some food, Matanistas. I definitely have a few favourites. Whether I can get into the best wine bar, the Taberna Tempranillo, or to the Basque Tapas bar, I don't know. But there will be places open for sure. So, 
the place I've ended up at Lamiac. It's a bass pinto or tapas bar. And it's somewhere that I've been to very briefly when I run my excursion here and got to taste a little bit of the food. But for once, I can sit back and relax. Starting with Carver before I order the food. And I can pronounce myself match fit. Come on, city. And in this sunny weather, Matanistas, it is thirsty work. This is how they touch the sides of the glass. Anyway, I'm mainly going to have red wine. And they had five by the glass, three euros ten each. Not bad value at all. Not sure about some of them, so I'm going to get to taste the Navarra. If I don't like it, I'll play safe and go with the Ribera del Duero, which most visitors to Spain, along with Rioja, have had a million times before. And the beauty of some of these places is even if you don't come to eat and you just take a drink, you often get a little free nibble or tapa on the side. Yeah, that Navarra red wine is going to go down magnificently. Right, Matanistas, the food has arrived and so has a surprise <laughs> guest. Now, those of you who watch City Vlogs frequently might have come across this guy, James from JSM44. And James doesn't normally partake in these food segments, but I've no. twisted his arm today. Okay, I'm ready for this. Um, the food looks fantastic. And as a true Martinista myself, I'm ready for this. This is going to be fun. James has gone for the local beer Mau, and our first plate of many has arrived. I'm not sure James is used to eating this much mutton stout, but we have Iberian ham, the best ham that the world can possibly offer, usually cured in Salamanca or Extremadura or Seville and Andalusia. OK, mutton Easters? Toasted bread dipped in the tomato relish, which is not sweet at all. It really is just tomatoes and olive oil. And it took me years and years to realise that in Spain, when you order a plate of ham, you eat it with your hands. I, so, I, I didn't know that, yeah. so I'm just going to dig in like yeah, an absolute yeah, go on. Right, yeah. here we go. I'm just going for it. I'm just going for it. Yeah. Eat it over the plate. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Spot on that. Really good. Proper Madrid ham. Yeah, those rich streaks of fat, very important. Don't trim them off. If you don't like the idea of eating it, order something else. Moist, flavoursome, fat adds so much flavour to it. And I thought for a second there was an emergency that I'd run out of wine. But whilst I was filming, by magic, the waiter came and topped me up. Okay, mutton Easters, next dishes are coming. I'm glad James has got a good appetite and I'm running into choppy waters with the amount of wine left in my glass yet again. Anyway, down to the table. On the right, beef moussaka. Not a dish of international mystery if you've ever had Greek food, but it is minced beef with bechamel and aubergine layers. And on the left, duck confit puff pastry. That's duck, preserved leg of duck, and I think there's some sort of vegetable in there, but I can't remember exactly what else is in there from my reading of the menu. OK, Matanistas, the dishes are flying out and I dropped a little bollock there. I haven't actually tasted them yet. That is apparently the lasagna, that is, and the moussaka is on the left. Sometimes they do look very similar. We also have octopus carpaccio and a bed of mashed potato and paprika and olive oil. And finally, we have the chicken breast with tetilla cheese, mustard and some smoked ham on a piece of bread, a typical Basque pincher. OK, duck first. Beautiful. It's in puff pastry, a lighter version of the pastry that you'd see on a Galician empanada, but otherwise it's very, very similar. And whilst there's no vegetable in there, there are some mushrooms. Anyway, quick slurp to cleanse the palate before we move on to the lasagna. And as stated on the menu, even though I didn't mention it 
to you previously, there is spinach in the lasagna, which is a slightly unusual addition. Although, don't forget, Italian cannelloni traditionally has spinach in the inside. Very well made bechamel sauce. Right, Mutton Easters, on to the octopus. There's a very, very famous Galician octopus dish called pulpo a la gallega, and this is a bit of a play on that. However, it's usually cooked octopus with the same seasoning of paprika and olive oil on a bed of boiled potatoes. This is on mashed potato, and I have no idea whether the octopus, being a carpaccio, is hot or cold. It's warmed a little, but it is a delicious creation. If you're into your squid, and I've forgotten the name for these things, squid, cuttlefish, octopus, this is probably the best dish that Spain has to offer from that group of shells. And now the moussaka, which I got mixed up before. Mmm. Yeah. Very, very tasty. I thought this was normally made with lamb, but they said it's made with beef there. I guess you can substitute them. And another interesting twist is that the aubergine is pureed. Very nice combination. And finally, the chicken breast, something I don't order very often, but the combination of tortilla cheese, which I've had in Spanish scrambled egg creations a few times, and smoked ham did it for me. Yeah, that's lovely, very tasty, and it's typical of the style of Basque tapas called pinchos, served on a piece of bread. This is a Basque restaurant, after all, and there are places both here in Madrid and in the Basque country where you can make a meal of just going from bar to bar to bar, having one drink and a little pincho. A little bit of mild mustard on top, and Robert is your uncle. Anyway, Mutton Easters, another quick slurp, and we will get on with this. And it's quite possible that I will have another glass of this. I think I need a top up as well. Exactly, I wholesomely agree. Yeah. And we'll be back shortly where I asked James which his favourite tapa was. Well, Mutton Easters, what a beautiful spread. Great beverages as well, and great company, of course. My favourite two plates here were the octopus and the ham, but we all have different tastes, and I want to hear from James what he thinks. Well, as a mutton Easter myself, I'm going to pick two plates as well. I'm going with the duck pastry. I thought that was superb. And I've got to go with the ham as well. It's just classic Hispania, and it was stunning. And how do you think the game's going to go tonight? <sighs> I would take a draw. I would take a one-goal loss. I've never seen City win at the Bernabeu. Maybe tonight's the night. 8-1 City. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Well, Metanis is a tad optimistic, that one. Uh, I'm with James on being happy with the draw here. I was here when we won 2-1. I even remember the date, 25th of February 2020, last game I went to before the COVID problem started. Anyway, I'm a little bit worried because Walker's not here. I think that's the only danger to City in this tie. If we can deal with counters and balls over the top or through our defence, I think we'll be all right. Anyway, so, a great start to the day, Mutton Easters. It's just after five o'clock, kickoffs at nine, so I'm going to take a little bit of a rest between now and the kickoff. I'll be back with you for the team news and further refreshment about an hour, an hour and a half before the game near the stadium. And a big thanks to James. His YouTube channel, JSM44, well worth looking incredible football knowledge in fact i'm not embarrassed to say a couple of times when i've bumped into him at away games i've had to ask him for information on the away team that's how much he knows anyway i'll see you later mutton easters right mutton easters off the sauce a bit until kickoff and given i'm in this part of the world i'm going to go for what for me is the best shave you can get anywhere at the quince de cuchilleros my favorite barbers Okay, in and out quickly, pretty close shave, great atmosphere and a great chat with the barber and the barbers. Off to the hotel now to dump my microphone case, charge the battery a bit, then straight off to the ground. See you then, Mutton Easters.
Well, Metamoosters, the exterior of this stadium has most definitely changed. I wouldn't expect the interior to be massively different. I do hope we go through the same entrance. And I also hope that those little bars around the side of the stadium are still there so I can bring you the team news over a quick slurp. OK, Mutton East is only 25 minutes before the game starts, so I've possibly gone a bit over the top here, and I'll only drink one of these two fairly large beers. Anyway, team news out, and Real Madrid, is, as you'd expect, their top goalkeeper Courtois is still out, and Alaba is still out, otherwise they've got their strongest 11 out. For City, though, Guardiola has gone very, very cautious, in my opinion. At the back, he's gone for experience of Guardiol, Ruben Diaz, Manuel Akanji and Johnny Stones. In midfield, Rodri, but with Kovacic. Then the front four of Bernardo, Jack Grealish, Phil Foden and Erling Haaland. No Kevin De Bruyne. In goal, Stefan Ortega keeps his place. Not sure exactly how fit Edison actually is, but he is on the bench alongside Doku and alongside Kevin De Bruyne, who are the men who might have to come on and change the game if we get into trouble. Anyway, I do share Guardiola's view here that City just need to avoid a disaster here. I think even a one goal defeat wouldn't be too bad. In fact, I was looking earlier to see when we lost last by two goals and it's a long, long time ago. I think it was a League Cup game against Southampton a year and a bit ago, which was a mess because we were playing all sorts of people in experimental positions. So I think two years ago, the 3-1 in extra time really was the last time that we lost by two goals. So reasons to be confident for City, but not too much because Real Madrid are a very, very tricky opponent and they have that pace and we don't have Walker. A lot of friendly Real Madrid fans here. I've never had a problem wearing my top and wearing colours, so I'm going to stick anyway with my prediction of a one-all draw tonight. Come on, City. intimidated by the atmosphere because we've been here and done it before. Come on City and a brave referee has given Real Madrid a yellow card within the first three minutes. Oh City! I couldn't tell who actually took that shot. Needless to say, massive deflection. And Lucky City won all. Ah, oh dear, this is really turning sour. This is what on earth happened there. I did warn that without Kyle Walker, this was a risk. Although I do think that we got back in position. So how Rodrigo got that toe poke that dribbled into the corner in, I have no idea. Come on, City, get a grip. Oh, fucking hell. Go on. Oh. Stop him from turn. Oh, shit.
Well, half time, Real Madrid 2, City 1. Great start for City with that cunning free kick which caught out the Real Madrid keeper and the wall. However, things were turned on their head pretty soon afterwards. A bit unlucky for the first one, a deflection. The second one, we were caught and caught badly. Not enough pace at the back and OK, yes, the second goal got a deflection as well. But I thought our defenders had actually got back into position in time to stop that goal. Could Ortega have done better? Not sure, we'll have to review the footage. Anyway, we've had a couple of other situations where they've broken on us. We've got to be careful there. 2-1 isn't so bad if this is how it stays. I don't see why we couldn't score in the second half, but we do not want to go back to the Etihad with a two or even three goal defeat here. So let's hope Guardiola sorts it out in the second half because we've had some promising positions going forward but no final ball and a reluctance to play anything at all adventurous. Some slot in possession, Bernardo in particular a couple of times, Erling Haaland some pretty iffy control, Rudiger's winning that battle, he can't turn him when the ball goes long, so I think a little tactical rethink is required. But OK, I'm just a punter who goes to games, I'm nothing of the quality of Guardiola when it comes to tactics, but if you're going to go a bit cautious, wouldn't you play Alvarez instead of Haaland in this game? Because Haaland, unless chances are being laid on for him, doesn't do a lot. I suppose the good thing is, anything he does do will be at the end of the stadium I'm at, and I'm hoping to see a City goal in the second half. Unfortunately, at this point, I turned off my microphones to preserve power because one of them had failed and I was on my reserve microphone. So I do apologise about this, but I'm just going to have to bring you the highlights of the second half without sound. Still, you'll get a gist of how good the goals are and the reactions of the crowd. and Easters, what about that? What a game that was. I think every game I've been to between City and Real Madrid has been a bit of a humdinger in one way or another. Anyway, first of all, apologies about the cock-up with the sound in the second half. I know this is coming because I looked at my microphone at full time and I thought, ooh, uh, having switched it off at half time to save energy, 
I forgot to switch it back on again and I don't even get the normal microphone from the phone that way. If only I'd have realised that, say, ten minutes in. Anyway, nothing I can do about that now, except for bringing you a little more food and drink and my two penneth about how the game went. As always, a little something to go with the drink that you order in northern Spain and central Spain. A glass of Ribera del Duero, and it's very reasonable, and again, only three euros ten. Well, what to make of that, Matanistas? I mean, are we unlucky that we conceded two deflected goals? I suppose, well, we pulled off two worldies as well. They don't always go in. Both teams are stacked with quality players. I think City have the slightly better players. Maybe Madridistas will disagree with me on that. And somebody had done their homework about how Madrid set up for free kicks earlier on. Between the goalkeeper and the ball, they weren't set and they weren't ready. And Bernardo Bernardo Silva spotted that and took full advantage. However, things quickly turned around and we conceded two very quick goals. When City concede in these big Champions League knockout stages, these goals seem to come in twos or threes all the time. First one couldn't do anything about, that was a massive deflection. But the second one, oh my goodness, allowing them to run in behind us. And then, I'm not sure exactly who between Akanji and Ortega was at fault there. That should not have dribbled in like that. Again, it did take a deflection though. The game quietened down a bit after that, although we did look a bit vulnerable on the counter and we were guilty of turning over possession with some sloppy passing at times. Then in the second half, City really got a grip of things after an early scare. We took the ball by the horns and we were camped in the Madrid half for a long period in the second half and eventually the goal came with a thunderbolt from Phil Foden. What a season he's having. And if that was a peach, well, Gvardiol's goal. I didn't know he had that in him. That was like a bullet into the top corner from the edge of the box. From the... Unfortunately, we let things slip a bit when Modric came on. I don't know why we sat off him. Maybe we had too much respect for him, but he started finding players, zipping it around, and eventually the equaliser did come. A fantastic volley from Valverde, but, but I'm not sure why he was unmarked on the far side of the box. So 3-3, a result I take. I thought it would be a draw beforehand. I didn't think it would be such an end-to-end -end high scoring draw. Maybe it was because Ancelotti decided that he needed to go for it in this leg given what happened at the Etihad last time and the fact that Real Madrid haven't actually won at the Etihad. And indeed at times at the beginning of the second half I thought hang on is he copying Jurgen Klopp here with this mid press trying to force over transitions on the halfway line. They did get one though and it nearly cost us badly. Anyway, the food has arrived and Spain and maybe Italy are probably the only countries in Europe, maybe Portugal, where I could still get a meal at this time. Thankfully we were let out after half an hour, which is about half the usual lock-in we get at the Bernabeu. So for the first time ever I've been able to get the metro back to the centre from the ground. Down to the table, Matanistas. And I bring you Chaos a la Madriana, which is beef tripe Madrid style. All sorts going on here, some more serious and black pudding, some chorizo, Spanish sausage, and sometimes a bit of pig's feet go in here as well. And obviously the main ingredient is the tripe itself. I love it. I know a lot of people are squeamish about offal, and British people in particular associate it with poverty and with some rubbery, boiled, horrible stuff that they were fed as children. But this is different gravy, as they say. Tender, meaty, soaks up that sauce. If you're wondering why the sauce is red, the first time I had it, I thought it was down to tomatoes, but it's not, it's actually paprika. And back in the day when it was possible to do so, I used to go for a late curry after football matches in England. These days you can just about get a late kebab if you're lucky, but here you can still get a late meal and this for me is more or less the equivalent of going for a late curry, it's the Madrid equivalent shall we say.
important of course to have a lot of bread with that because that sauce is so meaty and rich and peppery if that word actually exists. Anyway, quick slow. And I'm going to have to love you and leave you, Matanistas. My next football vlog will be the Real Madrid home leg next Wednesday. I can't go to the home game against Luton. I know a lot of you would be surprised that I could do a midweek Champions League away and I can't do a normal Saturday kickoff in the league. Again, I apologise about the sound and having to voice it over, but I hope you enjoyed the vlog anyway. And please remember to keep liking and pushing me up that algorithm so more people discover me. Keep subscribing. Press the bell button to be sure to know as soon as my videos come out that you're notified and you can watch them. But most of all, Muttonistas, don't forget, you can't beat a bit of mutton.